We're going to be in Luke chapter 2 this morning, uh, starting in verse 21. This is, I would say this is probably the most famous chapter in the Gospel of Luke. It's, it's read so many times uh, during the Christmas season. Uh, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was even read on Charlie Brown on the Christmas special. Uh, so it's, it's a very popular uh, account of Jesus' birth uh, for people to use at Christmas time. The interesting thing is the, 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 the scripture we're going to read this morning isn't typically associated with Christmas or the birth of Christ uh, or that time of the year. Even though these two people have closer, they're in closer proximity to those affairs, uh, even more than the wise men that are recorded in Matthew. Uh, we include the wise men at the birth of Jesus. Uh, we put him at the at the manger scene and all of, all of those uh, uh, things. They but uh, there's nothing in Scripture that indicates they were even there. Uh, but uh, these people uh, are in very close proximity to the birth of Christ, and uh, they're actually uh, their their song or, or prophecy, if you will, uh, is actually uh, very much a part of the uh, birth of Christ and his arrival here uh, as, a, as a man, as a human being. And uh, we're going to be starting in verse 21. And it says, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Um, I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. And... Uh, just mention this. I, I thought I think it's interesting. Uh, does anybody know why it's eight days? Now that's in the law of Moses. I understand that part. Uh, in the law of Moses, it's told that uh, after eight days, or on the eighth day, that's when you take your child and you your male child and you circumcise them. Now there's a reason why, and it doesn't say in the scripture why, but there is a reason why this is this way. I didn't know this until Levi was born. Do you, do you remember? Me? Yeah. Okay. The, the nurse, did you know before the nurse told us? I don't know. Well, she told us that from God. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Well, there was a nurse that, you know, was, Levi was a newborn baby, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, she told us that, uh, uh, the, you know, in the Bible it says on the eighth day, and she says, interestingly enough, that uh, uh, if you did it before then, that you run the risk of uh, free bleeding because the baby doesn't have uh, or could not, excuse me, it might not have enough vitamin K in the blood to clot sufficiently. But on the eighth day is when that is heightened. Uh, the vitamin K content in the blood is heightened during that time so that the blood clots quickly and easily. Uh, now, I'm not going to say that that's the reason why God chose the eighth day, but it is interesting that uh, it just so happens that physiologically, if you're going to do that, that's the wisest course of action to take. But the nurse told us, you know, but now we have blood clotters and stuff like that, so you can do it like right away. But um, at any rate, it's, it's interesting that God doesn't always tell us the reason why he tells us to do the things that we do or the things that, that he tells us. Uh, but it, it seems to be a safe bet to always consider that God is our creator. He knows our bodies better than we do. He knows us better than we do. And you can never go wrong by obeying him. And there's always a reason. There's always a reason for this that maybe might not be disclosed. Don't know what the reason. Whenever you have a child and you tell them to do something or not to do something, you don't bother with explaining why. It's usually because you said so. That's what you tell them. And you try to get them used to that concept of you do it because I'm the parent and I said so. Well, God is, is no different. There's things that, that he knows that we're not going to grasp or he, we're not going to understand. And why is not even relevant. It's enough to know that we do things we, that we do that he tells us to do because simply because he said so. But it's also nice when we learn uh, that there's good reasons 
for the way God has set things up. And then it says in verse 22, And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Uh, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according uh, to that which is in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or uh, two young pigeons. Now, one might ask why this took place even. Um, the, it goes back to the plagues in Egypt and the plague of the firstborn. Uh, whenever they got out of that place, um, well, God had instituted the Passover prior to them leaving. And that was how God protected their firstborn from this angel of death. And whenever they got out of that place, he told them that all of their firstborn belonged to him. Uh, and it didn't matter who or what. Didn't matter if it was a donkey. Didn't matter if it was a sheep or a cow, didn't matter what, or a human, or human being, didn't matter what it was, but it belonged to him. And it was a practice that they would take the firstborn of their animals and offer it as a sacrifice unto the Lord. The Lord doesn't want does anybody to sacrifice their children. As a matter of fact, that sort of thing makes him very angry. And, and uh, he does not approve of that in any way, shape, fashion, or form. He is very much opposed to it. But in his law, he devised a, a way that uh, it did, you didn't have to do such a thing, but still fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, and that was to have a substitute. And it also got people used to the idea of this having a substitute, because uh, ultimately that's what we have in Jesus. Uh, we All of us have a substitute that, uh, 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 that uh, goes and takes upon him God's wrath in our stead. But... Uh, the, uh, the law said that uh, they were to take a lamb or, or something of that nature to go and, uh, and, and, and redeem the firstborn. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to point out there, but if, I hope I don't forget the second thing. But the first thing I want to talk about is the, uh, uh, well, I think I will talk about the other first. The, the uh, <laughs> was why? You know, we understand, like I said, the mechanics of it. It was because he had redeemed the, uh, the, 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 the he had uh, redeemed the firstborn himself uh, by the by the blood on, on the doorpost that night. But all of the firstborn belonged to him, so he made a. I don't remember what the other one was. It slipped, slipped my mind. What that several things we can learn from this, but one of them is that. It was required of them of, of a lamb, you know, to do a lamb. Well, here it says two pigeons or two turtle doves. And what that is, there was provision in the law if you were poor, which a lot of people were, and maybe they don't have an animal to give to purchase their firstborn. So what they would do is, according to the law, they, they were able, uh, they were allowed to do a pair of turtle doves or, or, or pigeons instead. And that's what it says that Jesus' parents does. Well, what that tells us this about them is they were poor. They were very poor, so much so they didn't have an animal to give. They had to go with the alternative, which was uh, uh, a pair of turtle doves. And uh, the, the, what this also tells us is the nature of these things. Uh, the circumcision and, and, and the redemption of the firstborn. This had to happen to Jesus. When he came into this world. Well, one thing is, it, the, the scripture in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, it tells us that Jesus was born of a woman under the law, that he might redeem them that were under the law. And that's, you know, Jesus, whenever he was baptized even, you know, the, uh, John said, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, we need to fulfill all righteousness. I'm not saying that baptism was the law, but, but Jesus was there to do everything that was good and right to do. And the law was no different. It never says he'd come to do away with the law. It says he'd come to fulfill the law. But he fulfilled it on our behalf. And um, But he was born under it. So he did it. He, he completed it. Even as a baby, his parents saw to it that everything that he was supposed to do... Uh, uh, as an Israelite, as under the law, 
every requirement was fulfilled. And this also tells us the, the, something about the nature of these things. We know that Jesus had no sin. So uh, did these rites, did they, were they for removing sin? I think just simply because Jesus did it, it demonstrates that that's not its purpose. And never was its purpose. Circumcision, but the Jews thought so highly of circumcision, they used the word uncircumcision as a curse word to people that, that, that weren't, that weren't uh, uh, Israelites or, or, or Jews. Um, they, uh, uh, they might call the Gentiles uncircumcised dogs, for example. Just, uh, it, it was a derogatory thing. But they also used it as something that, as Paul encountered with the Galatians, they tried to use it as something that would make them more acceptable to God. That would make them, uh, that would somehow assist in the redemptive work. Uh, this is what they were holding to even after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And of course, Paul went through great lengths to show them and to tell them that this was not so. Uh, the same would have to be so for the redemption of the firstborn. It had nothing to do with sin. It had everything to do with fulfilling God's requirement for the law uh, in that uh, uh, all of the firstborn belonged to him and this was how you could redeem them. And Jesus was no different and uh, they did, did everything exactly the same way. People do the same thing with baptism, with Christian baptism. They assign a value onto it other than God did. And um, they want to, it's a, it's a physical manifestation of something that's happened phys, uh, uh, spiritually. Uh, circumcision was that way. God uh, he, uh, speaks of circumcision of the heart. And, and uh, that's what he sincerely desired from his people. Uh, it, it wasn't the cutting away of a piece of flesh. It had nothing, there's no spiritual value in that whatsoever. But the thing that it represented, it, there was value in that. Uh, baptism is the same way uh, for Christians. There is no value whatsoever to dipping down in a tub of water, whether it be uh, in a baptistry or whether it be in a river somewhere. It, it, it does, in and of itself, it does nothing to make you right with God. But we come to God and we're made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made. Now, it's because of that faith that we're interested in doing what he says and doing the, uh, what he wants us to do. And that includes baptism. It includes a whole host of things, uh, but also baptism. Uh, and for the Jews, circumcision, the redemption of the firstborn, all those things, they, they, they had a, a good reason and a purpose. Uh, but it, it never was to, uh, uh, to clear someone of their guilt, to clear someone of their sin. The only one thing that does that in this world, and that's the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us, and the way that we receive that, and the way that we uh, tap into that is through faith in Him. Um, now, in verse 25, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Uh, I want to stop right there for just one second. Um, now, they're going to the temple to bring their turtle doves to purchase the firstborn, to redeem it. And there's this man there. There's no indication that he's very old. Uh, now, Anna is the one that speaks about afterward, but we don't know how old he is. Uh, because he says, I can now depart in peace or whatever, people assume that he's at near death. Uh, but he might not even be talking about that. He might be that he's been waiting at the temple all this time. And that when this happens, he's, he's able to leave. But whoever Simeon is, we know this about him, that he was just and he was devout and he was waiting on something. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And it says, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, what he was waiting for, when it speaks about the consolation of Israel, he's talking about their delivery. He's talking about the, the one that will bring comfort and salvation to Israel. That's what he means by consolation. And the scripture is very plain about this. It tells of a Messiah that will come and deliver the people of God. 
And that's what he's waiting on. He's waiting to see this Messiah because what this Messiah means is deliverance from Israel. I think a lot of people forget that, especially uh, Christians, Gentile Christians forget that Jesus is in fact a Jewish Messiah. That's what his purpose and his intent was. As a matter of fact, he didn't, he expressed what, what, during Jesus' ministry, he himself expressed that he was sent only to the house of Israel. He said that. He didn't even want to go speak to the Samaritan people because of that, at least on one occasion. But, and it wasn't because he didn't want them to be saved. He spoke to them when he had opportunity, but his main and primary goal was the redemption of Israel. That's what he was here for. That was his purpose. Uh, and it, it didn't, uh, things didn't work out as, uh, uh, as uh, people understood. And it's not like it wasn't offered to them. It was, but, but uh, and, and Simeon talks about that in a minute in his prophecy. Um, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he shouldn't see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us, thou, thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So it's interesting that he mentions the Gentiles first, and, but he also is sure to identify this baby as the Messiah, as the Christ, the Lord's Christ, the people, uh, excuse me, the, the Messiah that was sent to deliver the people of God. And he was told by God that he would not die until he seen the deliverer of Israel. And here, lo and behold, as God is always true to his word, uh, this man says that now I can wait. Uh, now I can go in peace and put, because my eyes has, have seen him. It says that... Uh, uh, and, jo and Joseph and his mother... Uh, marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Uh, it's interesting too that it, it, the scripture here doesn't say his father and mother. It says Joseph and his mother because it's important to recognize that Joseph was a foster parent of sorts uh, and, and, he, and he wasn't any blood relation uh, to uh, uh, Jesus unless you consider him being a distant kin in the same way that uh, Mary was. Uh, they, they, they came from the same tribe. Uh, but at any rate, it says uh, that Joseph uh, and his mother marveled at those things. And it says in 34, And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, for a sign which shall be spoken against. And indeed, we do see this that uh, he is set for the rise and the fall of many. And that's the thing that people need to understand about Christ. And it even says this in, in the scripture that, that, uh, uh, that, we can, that, that, that he's the, he's the uh, uh, chief cornerstone that the builders rejected has become a stumbling stone to them and they fall over him. And this is, they, they, they stumbled at the promise of God and instead of receiving it and accepting it. And um, even to this very day, it says that, that um, there was a, a, a sign which shall be spoken against. And that sign is, is the sign. And that's what Jesus said during his ministry. He says, won't be any sign given to you except for the sign of Jonah. Well, the sign of Jonah was that he went into the belly of the well for three days and three nights, just as Jesus went into the heart of the earth, as the scripture says. He was buried. Uh, for for the same for three days and three nights, and the uh, uh, that's the sign that's spoken against. It's spoken against to this very day. To this very day, people either uh, 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 they, they they'll they'll fall over him, they'll stumble over him, they will stumble over the gospel and miss it altogether, uh, or they will rise, or they will Jesus will be the result of their 
of their resurrection even. And um, I guess you could use the word rise too, uh, metaphorically as well. But um, nevertheless, that's a decision that all creation, all men will have to acknowledge. What do you do with Jesus? Do you reject him as they rejected him as the chief cornerstone? Or do you believe in him or do you receive him? And that's a question that everyone, you, there is no fence that, for you to straddle. You, everyone, every human being that has ever been born will have to make that decision. And everyone that will be born will have to make that decision. That's how important it is. And, and, and uh, uh, Simeon uh, prophesied to this end concerning him. Now it says, uh, Yea, a sword shall also pierce through thine own soul also, and the thoughts of many hearts, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Um, one thing that Jesus does do, uh, is, you know, that you can see is that indeed uh, the thoughts of people's hearts are revealed. Uh, he even said this during his earthly ministry, once again, that you shall know them by their fruit. You can see what a people is thinking by the actions that they take. And that uh, whenever you see someone and how their response to Jesus, their response to Christ, it re indeed reveals uh, who they are inside. But back to the parenthetical statement, yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also. It's believed that this is talking about Mary. Mary was there when they crucified Jesus. I don't understand this. Um, and I think it's a trait that women possess uh, more so than men. But uh, I think I would probably be like one of the other disciples and go somewhere and hide away somewhere. Uh, you know, that's something I would not want to witness. I would not want to see. I would not want to see anyone that I love and care about mistreated in such a way and crucified in such a way. I would not want to experience that. But for that person that's being treated that way, it's, uh, it would be a little different. At least you would have some comfort in knowing that someone was there with you that you loved and cared about. And when Jesus looked down, he saw John, he saw his mother, and that's when he said, behold your mother, behold your son. He was telling John, take care of my mother. It's a truly touching and uh, special moment uh, on the cross. But I can't imagine how that must have hurt his mother to experience that and to see that. So it truly would be a sword through her heart, through her spirit. But here's the neat thing. That's not the last we hear of Mary at that scene. That scene that, that Simeon is telling her about as her son is just a baby. Uh, Mary shows up again in Acts. And you know where she's at? She's in the upper room with the rest of the disciples praying after she has seen the resurrected Savior. I assume she, was, she saw him. It says that everybody saw him. I mean, not everybody, but a great number of his disciples saw him. I would think it would be odd that he would show himself to the 12 and show himself to Mary Magdalene and, and not show himself to his mother. But there she was in the upper room praying with the disciples when on that day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and settled upon the people there. Uh, so there, while she did experience such heartbreaking sorrow, she did get to experience that God raised him from the dead that she knew that it wasn't the end of him, that she would see him again. And it says that, uh, and then after that was uh, this uh, Anna in verse 36. It says, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Aser. Uh, she was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years. That's 84. Uh, which departed not from the temple, but served God night, uh, served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Now, this woman got married at a young age. She had her husband seven years, and he died. From that moment, she was a widow for 84 years. She stayed at the temple the whole time. 
And she it says that she prayed and fasted night and day. It doesn't mean that she never slept uh, and she never ate because what else is there between night and day? That's pretty much it. Now, everybody, well, I can't say everybody, most everybody fasts at night. Unless you're getting up right in the refrigerator, you're fasting at night. That's my trouble. But uh, most everybody fasts at night. Not everybody fasts during the day. But that's what it's telling us, is that Anna would fast not only at night, but she would fast for periods during the day too. She completely and, and totally had devoted herself uh, to God and to his service at the temple for those 84 years after her husband had died. It's remarkable. Um, and it says that she, uh, and she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord. But she, and she didn't stop there. She gave thanks just as Simeon did. Uh, but she also, it says, um, spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. So she spake to, to not just, you know, she, she told the story to everybody that she could of what she had seen and who she had seen and what she had got to experience. And um, again, that, you know, she's with him now. But that through that whole 84 years, um, I, I don't, I don't, it doesn't say what that was like or or, uh, but uh, the Lord saw to it that he would bless this woman by enabling her to see his son. And she came in as this event was happening. And it says that, and when they had performed all these things, according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit, filled with wisdom and, the, and grace was upon him. Now, this speaks of Jesus' childhood. There are stories that are out there that, you know, I remember reading one where somebody threw a rock, killed a bird, and Jesus was a little boy, and he ran over and resurrected the little bird, and so it flew away. Uh, I read another story where these are in uh, uh, supposedly extra-biblical writings. And, uh, well, they're not supposedly. They are extra-biblical if they're not in the Bible. But uh, uh, the, and then there was another one where Jesus was in school and they were teaching him the alphabet and he wouldn't, he wouldn't tell them the uh, second letter in the alphabet until they could tell him the meaning of the first one and the teacher ran back to slap him and lost use of her arm. Uh, you know, that kind of a thing. And there's no, there's no uh, validity to any of these stories. Uh, I can tell you why. Luke tells us everything there is to know about Jesus through his childhood. And the, the, the most pertinent information is just that, is that he waxed strong in the spirit. Well, he grew, as children do. He waxed strong in the spirit. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That's what Jesus' childhood was like. Um, the, there was nothing extraordinary about him through that period. You know how we know that he didn't perform any miracles as a child? We know that those things are fully and completely false. Because in John chapter 2, in verse 11, it speaks of the miracle of Jesus turning the wine, uh, water to wine in Cana of Galilee. And it says this is the beginning of the miracles that Jesus did. So I can be confident in telling you that all those stories in these extra biblical documents about Jesus doing all these miraculous things as a little boy are completely and utterly false. Aside from that, he did nothing out of the ordinary. He did nothing extraordinary because when he went to his hometown, they wouldn't receive him because they would say things like, isn't this Joseph the carpenter's son? If he was going around resurrecting dead birds and curse, putting hexes on teachers and whatever else they, they claim, they would say, oh, that's that, that's that weird boy that was doing all the miracles. <laughs> he didn't do anything like that. The only thing he did was what it says right here. And that's the only relevant thing. Other than that, it was a very normal childhood. Now, Luke 
is inspired to write at least one event that took place. And we can read about that in the following verses. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Stop right there for a second. Um, there was, this is interesting, uh, you know, uh, Levi is 12. So at this moment, you know, Jesus was the same age that Levi is now. And uh, so it, it, you don't think it all that abnormal if we were to leave him behind and let him mingle with family members if we were on a trip or something like that. It's not that strange because when a child starts getting to that age, you start loosening the, you know, the, the leash as it, as it were and, and give them a little more freedom. And uh, so it's not a, an abnormal thing that his parents did here. Uh, and, but it says that uh, they assumed that he was with other people in their company. Um, it says they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kin, folks, and acquaintance. So after the day, at the end of the day, they started wondering, well, where's Jesus? Where did he go? And they don't find him. They ask their relatives, have you seen him? No, we assumed he was with you. Or we assumed he was with you. And that kind of a thing was happening. And um, it's, uh, this was not something new that they did either. This was something that they, that they were doing on a yearly basis. Every year they would make this trip, uh, them and their families with them. And uh, after they discovered he was gone, after they discovered he was missing, uh, it says, they, when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him. Three whole days without their son, uh, not knowing where he, where he was. Uh, but they didn't look in the most important place. And according to Jesus, it was the most obvious place to look. And... Uh, it says, and it came to pass after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. They've been looking for him for three days, didn't know where he was. She tells Jesus, why did you do this to us? We've been looking for you for days. And he said unto them, how is it that you sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? Now Mary said, you know, tells that, that father and I have sought them, but she's speaking about Joseph. But Jesus tells her that wouldn't you know that I would be about my father's business? Wouldn't you know that I, this is where you would find me? Um, the, it says, and they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Um, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. And his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And that's the, not the first time that that tells us. Uh, Mary, there were so many things that she didn't understand. And, you know, Mary had contact with a celestial being, with an angel of all things, that came and announced what was going to happen. And, and, uh, but she still had trouble grasping exactly what was going on and exactly what was going to happen. But she'd done, again, and I've spoken on this before, I'll speak on it again, she'd done the most important thing she could have done is she latched on to the things that she heard and she saw. She might not know what they mean, but she felt like one day it's going to all fit together. One day all of this is going to come together and it's going to make perfect sense. I don't know, I can't see that now, but one day it will. And what an attitude, and that's the attitude that all believers should have. We should take in the things that God shows us that we experience in this life we should take in what the scriptures say, even though we don't understand what it says, 
And we, can, we should take it, cherish it, hold on to it, and know that one day it's going to all mesh together and we're going to understand. But in the meantime, all we can do is latch on to what we have, what we have heard, what we have seen, and know that one day God's going to use that and he's going to, he's going to show me and he's going to reveal these things to me. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And that was how Jesus' childhood went. That was how Jesus' life went all the way up to the point to where he was 30 years old. Uh, nothing remarkable, nothing out of the ordinary. That's how it went. But, you know, I thought about this uh, story about, you know, leaving Jesus in Jerusalem. And I thought it was interesting uh, that, you know, the scripture tells us, and we need to be sure about this, because the scripture tells us, and that is the Lord says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I won't do those things. But that doesn't mean that we don't wander from him. And we can in our hearts. Our hearts can wander from him and go into places that, and assuming that Jesus is right there, he's always where he has been, but you turn and you look and you realize, wait a minute, I, my heart has wandered far from him. The hymn, uh, I was singing it this, or not singing it, I was humming it this morning, uh, uh, Come Thou Found. There's a part in the verse that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Because, and it says that, and it's very true. And anybody that's a Christian can sing those words. And when you read them and you see them, you identify them to such a great degree because it's a continuing thing. Especially when things are going well, especially then, we we're trucking right along in life and we're getting right along. And, and understand, I'm not saying that Jesus leaves you. He never leaves you. But you and your heart can wander from him. Assuming that everything is as it always has been. But then you get to the point to where you realize, wait a minute, I've done something wrong here. I've, missed, I've made a misstep. And Jesus is not in the place where he should be in my heart. I've cast him off to the side somewhere and I've left him somewhere. Well, isn't it interesting when you lose something, there are certain steps that are guaranteed to help you find it. And that is if you go, one is if you go back to the last place you saw it. And, and uh, Jesus is no different then as he is today. He's still to this very day, even though he's in glory, even though he's in his, on his throne, he is still about his father's business. And he will always be about his father's business. And if you ever find that you've wandered from Christ, then that you, you, you try, you got, you got to retrace your steps. You got to go back to where it was that you last saw it. And the scripture tells us that where two or more are gathered, there I am in the midst. You know, that's the first place that a Christian need, finds when they wander from God and when they, when they wander from Christ and when they lose track of where he's at in their life, it's usually, it always goes hand in hand with, with uh, leaving uh, the church. And by that, I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the people, the body of believers that are gathering together. And, and, and that was a place, they were, they were in the temple, but, the, but it wasn't really designed for what they were doing, but it was the right thing to do. Uh, they, it's the same as the synagogues were in, in that day and age. And it, it had become a place to uh, uh, teach and to share what was in the word of God. And I, want, I say that because I don't mean, when I say church, I don't mean just any old place that has a sign where people gather on Sunday morning. I'm talking about a place where people are discussing and hearing the word of God being taught. Amen. Because that's how we know the Lord. And that's how we know the business of the Lord. It's we go where it's being taught. So whenever we lose track, whenever we wander from God, as we're prone to do, there's a guaranteed place where you can always find him. And that's where the word of God is being taught and preached and believed. And, and, and that's, you know, that's where you find him. I know that's been my own experience when I've wandered from God. Now, I still wander even though I'm faithful in church. I'm the pastor. I have to, 
pretty much have to be here. But uh, so if you if you see me not show up, there's something really bad wrong. But but that that doesn't mean that I don't wander. Also, and I'm not saying that this going to church is some kind of a magical formula that keeps you from falling or keeps you from failing. It's not. But whenever you find that you're not in church or you find that you've wandered away from Christ in your heart, even though you're a believer, this is the place where you get back is where God's people are gathered. It doesn't matter if it's in a church building or in someone's home. It doesn't matter where, but where God's people are gathered and they're gathered to worship him and they're gathered around the preaching and teaching of his word, just as they were in that temple for those three days. And, and they marveled at Jesus. They marveled at his answers. They marveled at his questions. They marveled at the things that he knew. And, and, and uh, it's so it should be in the churches of God. Now, there should be, a, 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 even though he's not here physically, he's here spiritually. He's here in spirit because he is where people are gathered in his name. And this is where you find him when you lose track of, of, of him. This is where you find him when you find that you've gone on without him, that you've wandered off somewhere, that, and then you realize, wait a minute, where is he? Well, uh, it's, we find him the same place that Jesus' parents find him. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time together. We do thank you, Lord, for your scripture. We thank you, Lord, for the promises therein. I know, Lord, that we can trust you in every, in every aspect of our lives. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us to give proper credence to your word and the promises there so that we can know, just as Simeon knew, that you are going to do a thing and that you are going to fulfill your word. Father, I pray that you would help us to look for not just the deliverance of Israel, but for the deliverance of this world. And we know, Lord, that there's a promise that you're going to return and that you're going to rule and reign this world and that you're going to uh, do it in a way that is righteous and that no one has witnessed yet. Lord, I pray for this day to come. But in the meantime, I pray, Father, that you would help us to have our hearts near to you. Let us not wander far. And let us always know how to get back when we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.